This episode of Stand Up and Holler is brought to you by Thrive Fantasy. Come prop up on Thrive Fantasy this football season. Thrive Fantasy is a daily fantasy sports and esports app for player props. With Thrive, you can eliminate the countless hours of research and focus on only the top tier athletes that have the biggest impact on the game. Choose 10 out of the 20 available player props to build your lineup. Each prop is assigned a fantasy value for both the over and the under based on how likely it is to hit. Hit the most props and rack up the most points to win a share of the prize pool. Use promo code REACT when you sign up today and you'll receive a 100% instant first deposit match up to $100. Download Thrive Fantasy on the App Store or Play Store or by visiting their website www.thrivefantasy.com. Sign up and prop today. I'm Nick Newton, joined by Will Miles. Welcome to Stand Up and Holler. It's time to dissect commiserate, complain, et cetera, about Florida's first loss on the gridiron in Lexington, Kentucky since 1986. And, Will, it's only the seventh loss to the Wildcats since the two schools began playing each other on an annual basis uh, about uh, 54 years ago, I believe. So that that's quite that's quite an accomplishment last night for the Kentucky Wildcats that we witnessed there. On tonight's episode, we're going we're gonna to cover – how the penalties and mistakes and the not so special teams hampered the Gators all night, the conflicting dynamic and Mullins approach to Emory Jones uh, will offer analysis on the defense that for the most part did its job. Uh, that's something different to offer here. In the last couple uh, from the last couple seasons here. And, and where do we go from here? That's what we're going to wrap up with uh, on the show here. So, Will, how you feeling tonight, man? I mean, I've been better. I was up late dissecting the game, and it was really depressing to watch it a second time. You, you've done it too, so you know, watching that debacle a second time is is not the best, the best feeling in the world. At the same time, I think there are probably some positives we can take out of it. Obviously, there are some negatives as well, and and we'll talk about that too. But uh, you know, a disappointing loss for Florida. But you're still three and two. You're probably not playing for anything beyond pride at this point. But at the same time. You know, you are playing and we'll get into this in the where do we go from here section, but you are starting to play for, you know, positioning for for next year. And you have the opportunity now to maybe give some people some playing time that you wouldn't have if you were really in the running for for a real SEC or playoff championship, kind of like they did last year. Right. That younger guys couldn't get an opportunity because the, until that LSU game, they were they were, you know, in the running for, for a title. And, and that's not the case this year. So it's a little bit different year. But, uh, you know. It's also one of those things where I think we've um, last year, especially, I think some of the transfers, Kyle Trask, Kyle Trask's emergence, those sorts of things staved off what usually ends up being a third year drop off for for coaches. And Mullen was able to stave that off and have a pretty successful year last year. And now some of those things that typically happen in the third year look like they're starting to happen here in year four for Florida under Mullen. And so, uh, you know, I think there's reasons for optimism, but certainly reasons for concern, too. So we'll get into all of that. Well, Will, I, I do want to I do want to take the time before we dive into the show to give full credit to Mark Stoops for building that Kentucky program into something that's can can jump on these opportunities. We saw Tennessee; they dropped our issue with the game against Tennessee last week was there were a lot of opportunities they had that they just didn't convert on or take advantage of that could have made the night uglier for the Gators. This Kentucky team and program they're at a point where they built it up. I've never seen Kentucky like that. Now, I'm not going to sit here, and we're, we're going to talk about the fall starts. I'm not going to sit here and talk about Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky being the cause of the Florida Gators really struggling. Hey, hey, if Lexington bothers you, good luck in Death Valley a couple weeks from now, okay? Like, this is the Florida Gators here. We can handle a trip to Lexington, Kentucky. But the fact that Stoops has that program to a point where they're at least excited enough where that type of support's out there – that's something different that we haven't seen a whole lot in our lifetimes at Kentucky. So before we dive into the Gator side of it, I want to do that quick credit to Kentucky because I have no further interest in giving them any credit whatsoever because it's it's Kentucky and we're Florida and we should not be losing to Kentucky very often. Yeah, well, thanks to Mark Stoops to, for not going to Tallahassee 
Because just imagine what it would just imagine what would have happened at Florida State if he'd have gone to Tallahassee instead of Willie Taggart, or if he'd have gone instead of Mike Norvell. You know, that was those were sort of the rumors. And it seems like the people in game in Tallahassee didn't think like he was a sexy enough hire for that job. But you know, <laughs> Florida State isn't going to be beating Florida anytime soon. And so uh, you know, yeah, I mean he's built he's built a pretty decent program there. I think they're five and zero. Oh, obviously you beat Florida. And so you, you can only beat the teams in front of you. I think we all expect them to get waxed by Georgia, but uh, you know, I, I'm going to be a Kentucky fan when they're facing Georgia. That's for sure. So, uh, you know, congrats to them and, and hopefully good luck against the Bulldogs in the future. Maybe they'll lose a couple of games and let Florida sneak back in. Well, I'll have to correct you there. Well, they did beat Florida in points, but not in yards. Let's jump into two bits here where Florida, another bit of yardage the Gators dominated last night was the penalty yards, 15 penalties for the Gators last night and half of which were false starts, infuriating throughout the entire game, particularly down the stretch here. But, Will, there's also the type of penalties that you don't want to see in the first half here. And, and, and these are – first, and we saw one in the second half, just the penalties that are pretty avoidable. You saw Dewan Black in, like, a full two yards into the Kentucky sideline shove a guy, unnecessary roughness. Sets the Gators up. Instead of being at the 40, they're at their own 25. The first field goal attempt, fourth and four from the Kentucky 30-yard line. Instead of calling a timeout, delay of game. Watson was late in the field. I think he was late because Mullen seemed to hesitate for a second on whether or not he was calling. He probably just wasn't paying attention with just on Watson and everything, but I think that's why Watson was on the field. But nobody recognized that to call that a timeout. You had another offsides on special teams on a kickoff, which really didn't cost them too bad, but still mental errors, right? And then on a Kentucky punt, I, I this this ended up not costing the Gators either, but I'm not sure what Jadarius Perkins was doing, but he just dove on top of a ball that had been touched by the Kentucky player. So it was down, didn't really matter, but cost a whole scrum. But what are you doing either way? And then the second half, Will, in terms of the mental errors, Interception, big play by Trevez Johnson, which we'll talk about later. But you get a legal blindside block by Valentino, which instead of starting on a Kentucky 16, you start on the 31 on that. So all types of mental errors throughout the game. And that's before we even get in to the false starts. Yeah, well, so this isn't necessarily new, right? I mean, this has been something that's sort of been building up. There were penalties against USF and FAU that you sort of looked at and said those are discipline penalties. Those popped up. Obviously, you know, the game against Alabama, you miss the extra point, costs you the game in that one at least, or at least forces you to go for too late. Now you have the, the field goal that's blocked and returned the other direction. The one thing you didn't mention there in the special teams, very early on, Kentucky penned Florida deep hmm. on a punt. And Florida just decided on it was like fourth and 13 and Florida just decided they weren't going to rush. And so the Kentucky punter just sort of stood back there after he got the snap for like three seconds, let this entire team run down. And they were standing right around Henderson as he caught the ball, at like the 10 or 11 yard line for a fair catch. Like, uh, you know, it seems like a really minor thing. But it's not a really minor thing when you give up 15 yards of field position every time the ball changes hands. And that's what it felt like, right? And then when you factor in the false starts that we're going to go through in a minute, they were constantly, constantly just sort of having to deal with self-inflicted problems. And, you know, that's one of the reasons you only get 13 points in a game against a team that gave up, what, 35 or 38 to Missouri. I mean, so, you know, the reality is, is I think Florida's offense is better than Missouri's offense, but you only scored 13 and, and that's how you lose those games is those little mistakes that build up over time and kill drives. Yeah. And it wasn't just that the mistakes were happening. They were in critical moments and we're, we're going to go through each and every false start here because these eight false starts, I think they tell a story. <laughs> because of the you're a masochist. That's why. <laughs> they, they, they tell the story of the game. Uh, so the first false start of the night, third drive of the game I have here, third, third, and, uh, third and eight, Delance gets nailed for the false start. The play before he had gotten beaten by, I, I believe it was Pas no, maybe uh, I think it was Pascal that had beaten him on the outside. So it forces uh, the Gators into third and thirteen. Delance is once again, even though he got a false start on the, he was nervous after the second down where he gets beaten. Third, third and 13, he gets beaten again on the edge. Emory has to throw a crossing route as he's getting hit because he has to rush the throw because he's got a guy in his face. So it didn't really matter that you got the false start on the play before. He still got beat on the third down. Delance in uh, pass coverage. We've had that conversation before. Don't need to dive that, into that again. At the end of the uh, first quarter, when the Gators took over the ball here, Rick Wells, they start the drive off. It takes him into the second quarter. 
Davis gets stuffed in the backfield on second and one, which creates third and one, where this is really the start of the problem all night. Emory Jones in the shotgun. And, Will, I don't know if you noticed this cadence. It seemed like you'd see his head go forward, so it's almost like a hut, and then clap, clap. I don't know what was causing the issue all night, but that cadence was not well received, particularly by the center, Egwakon. I, it, I, Davis leans forward. It's on the running back on, on the on the first uh, penalty here. But on the second one, on the next play, on third and six, all of a sudden you're dealing with the third and 11 because the entire offensive line gets a false start. And at this point, you have the two guards in Emory walking up to Egwakon, talking to him, and it really seems like he just was off on the timing with that with that snap. Yeah, I mean, Agocon struggled, right? I mean, I don't think there's any doubt about that. You had sort of a weird twitch, I'm sure we'll get to in a little bit, about that that Stuart Reese had a few times. The, the guys were just not coordinated in terms of how they were jumping. And I was kind of surprised that Florida didn't go to a silent count as opposed to using the, the claps that they were using. I know that's what they use. I know that's what they practice. But you would have figured that they would have gotten over on the sideline and made some adjustments. They just never did, and it continued to kill them over and over and over again. Third and one becomes third and 11 uh, in deep in your own territory. So Mullen goes conservative, hands the ball off. It gets blown up anyway. But this it was the same on, on, on the play they ran on third and 11. Guess what the snap count was? Hut, clap, clap. Same snap count. So they weren't making an adjustment. But you would think they would figure it out. But you saw Mullen, by the way, after that drive, talking to Egwakon on the sideline and, and while the punt's going off. And for the record on that punt, I just wanted to mention this because let's find some good things to, here. Uh, Crawshaw, punter, he had a couple of punts that weren't so great yesterday, but this particular punt, he's standing on the tee in the Kentucky on the end, in the back end zone, about two yards from the end line, and he kicked it in the air for a fair catch to the UK 35. That's almost 75 yards of hang time there, Will. I was impressed with the Australian on that one. I thought that was a great, great punt. Do you happen to catch that? I mean, no, that wasn't really what I was paying attention to. And there were some 20 yard punts later. So um, <laughs> just throw that out there. I thought that one was interesting. Hey, all, always look, always looking on the positive side, Nick. Next try, false start. Try to find one. Next false start. We end up, we, we, next false start is on the, in the third quarter on the seventh drive of the game for the Gators here. This is right after Kentucky is blowing up. Stoops is blown up on the sideline. Three missed calls went, that didn't go their way, according to them. It's third and three. And we get another false start. Multiple old linemen rush. They, they, and by the way, on this play, they rushed the snap because the defense was not set. Garage and Reese, they got off early. The rest of the line was in there. But right after the snap, Gamble looks at Egricon again, like going, what, what's going on? They just seemed their cadence was completely off. Third and three becomes third and eight on the, on the next play. Incomplete pass on a slant play to Davis. And UF ends up punting again. So rather than a manageable third three where you can run it, ends up in a punt again. So – Mistakes, mistakes, mistakes here. All right, Will, on the 11th drive here, we are into the fourth quarter. This is The Gators are going down the score here. Uh, they, it's the, ultimately the field goal drive that brings it to 20 and 13. It's fourth and two on the Kentucky 10. Jones ends up getting the play, but it, the whistles were going in the middle of the play. They, he ends up getting the first down. Whistles were going in the middle of the play, and once again, Snap was like getting out. False start on the Gators. I know where Lossie said he didn't really clearly see it on the on the commentator there. He didn't really see it. But anyway, snap was late getting off. We don't get the first down. Instead, we end up settling for a field goal on that play. And then, of course, you go the final drive of the game, which I think we all remember pretty well. You have the third and goal. False start after the Gators get down to the five-yard line. False start. Same cadence, by the way, Will. Same cadence, hut, clap, clap. The same one causing issues with centers late on the snap again, causes it to be third and goal from the 10. Gators get the bailout on the, on the face mask with Emory Jones. And then once again, on second and goal on the new set of downs, false start. Guess what the snap count was, Will? Hut, <laughs> clap, 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 clap. Davis flinches before he goes in motion off to the right. I was in motion. He was running a route off to the right. He was starting on the left. He was running to the right. Davis flinches. And, uh, yeah, that's how – that was the Gators' night in in, uh, in uh, fall starts there, Will. Uh, I, I normally would not go through and read individual penalties from a game, but I think they were such a critical defining part of this game in so many different situations. 
I'm not even getting into the holding call that we had where Pierce gets the first down that ends up coming back and we end up, uh, that ends up being the drive where we get the field goal blocked. Uh, and so th- there's, there's all types of penalties you can sit here and talk about with this game, but the Gators have no one but themselves to pl- blame for this loss last night. No, the funny part is, is if you go and look, well, maybe not funny, I guess the, the thing that the maddening part in this is if you look at that last drive, when they got in the red zone, they actually, they had first and goal from the nine and gained enough yards to score a touchdown. It's just, so it's just that they had so many false starts and negative plays on that drive mm-hmm. that they weren't able to get in. And they're, you know, they're throwing the ball from the, you know, what six yard line or something like that, trying to, trying to fit the ball into Whittemore there on the last play. No, nah, I mean, it was a comedy of errors, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you can't have running backs who were jumping off. I thought Malik Davis played really poorly yesterday. It was really surprising that they didn't have Damian Pierce in there more because Pierce actually ran the ball better. And then you figure that, you know, if the guy can't, if the guy can't, um, if he's not contributing anything in the passing game, and some of that was his fault, some of that was was Emory Jones' fault. But if he's not contributing anything in the passing game and he's not able to get past the guys who are breaking through, and that was the thing is that Kentucky – had a relatively relatively unique setup front that Florida was really struggling with on the interior part of its offensive line, and a guy like Pierce was able to was able to gas him a few times when he got past the defensive lineman. Davis and Naquan Wright struggled to get past those guys, so I was a little bit surprised that Pierce didn't play more. Um, you know, the quarterback run game really didn't get going until the last couple of drives of the game when they really needed it. Um, it was just ugly. Whole thing was ugly. And that's what happens when you score 13 points, right? 13 points on the road. Um, you know, like you mentioned, 15 penalties. Florida now ranked 117th in the entire country in penalties per play. So on a per play basis, a rate basis, they are one of the worst teams in the country. Um, right there with Clemson, another one of those teams that's 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 not really all that great on offense. So highly penalized team. And that's fine if you're scoring 35 points. It's not if you're struggling and can't move the ball down the field. And you know, the other thing that I think we wouldn't maybe put in the comedy of errors for the entire game, but really I think should fit there, is that Florida has struggled in the red zone all year long. And it got masked a little bit with the success they had in the third and fourth quarter against tennis, against Alabama. It got masked a little bit by the fact that they were able to get in against Tennessee. Though if you think back, they had that Kodak play, the throwback to Whittemore that then got thrown into the end zone mm-hmm. and, you know, sort of trick the team to get the ball to the end zone. When's the last time Emory Jones from the five or six yard line dropped back and threw a touchdown pass into the end zone. I can't think of one. And until they get to a point where they can do that, like, you know, you can talk about the deep shots. You can talk about, you know, inconsistency at the quarterback position. You talk about a lot of different things, but until you can drop back, have multiple routes going to the end zone, pick out the right guy and throw it to him for a touchdown, you're going to struggle. I mean, if you think about the, the touchdowns, it's the one out to Frazier's on the little outside screen. If you think about the game against, against Tennessee, it was Rick Wells coming across the formation like a tight end, like Kyle Pitts would have last year, opening him up for, for that sort of stuff. Those are tricks to get into the end zone. That's not a quarterback dropping back, reading the, the defense and then figuring out a way to get it into the end zone. And you know, Florida has struggled in the red zone, struggled against Kentucky. And, you know, you factor in all of the things that are associated with the with the penalties and not being able to make that up. This isn't a team that's going to convert third and 13s. This isn't a team that can afford to give up a down, which is what happened a bunch of times where, you know, they'd get five yards and then they'd get a false start. And you're back to second and 10. So you're behind the chains, even though you were successful on your first down play. This team can't do that. And that's that's really what happened in this one is, um, you know, Kentucky played pretty well. Kentucky did have some unique scheme schematic things. I don't think Florida did a real nice job of adjusting to. At the same time, Florida was the better team and just decided they didn't want to show it. What Speaking of adjustments, the reason I harped on the hut, clap, clap, the cadence is when you mess it up one time, okay, you do it a second time. Maybe start to reconsider a third time. Definitely reconsider. Why? Why are there so many examples of the same issue cropping up? And even if you're like, "Hey, the rest of the guys are getting it, and the quarterbacks got it," it's just the center. Well, the center is kind of an important dude to not be understanding exactly the timing of the cadence, right? Like, why are we not seeing a simple adjustment like that being made? Why do we throw shoes? I mean, at the at the end of the day, there are discipline issues with with the team, and and it seems to be pervasive, right? That if you think about last year in the LSU game, you think about really over the last four years that 
under Mullen, there have been times where Florida's shown up and hasn't been ready to play against teams that are inferior. And, and you saw the same thing against Kentucky. This was an inferior team that Florida showed up to play. Now, I mean, that's a little bit insulting to Kentucky because Kentucky won the game. But again, to go back to Mullen's comments after the game, they outgained them considerably. They were a more physical team. They did a better job running the ball. Um, you know, and, and it comes down to all the little discipline things that Florida just decides that they don't need to do. And so, you know, eight false starts is unacceptable. And whoever's responsible for those sorts of things, Malik Davis jumped off twice. Mm -hmm. How the hell does your running back jump off multiple times? He, you know, even if he doesn't have the snap count, he doesn't need to move, <laughs> like, like watch the ball, right? Like this isn't something where the offensive line can't be watching the ball. You know, if, if there's something going on at center and the, and the right tackle moves, that might be the center's fault. But when the running back moves, that that's the running back's fault. And so, you know, this has been pervasive. You know, Marco Wilson throws the shoe. He doesn't come off the field. You see bad plays repeatedly and guys don't come off the field. That's been something that's been um, a mark of bullet. Now, what I will say is, is that I do think that there is a benefit to not always looking over your shoulder. But I think there's a downside to never looking over your shoulder and the combination that, you know, there's a there's a middle ground to be met there. And I think the 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 staff tends to err more on the side of, well, we're just going to let this guy try to get it right. But at some point, you know, there needs to be consequences when you don't do those things right. And, you know, we'll see if that happens this week. Right. I mean, maybe there will be consequences coming into this next week. They didn't have the comfort to bring somebody in in a hostile environment. And they still did have a shot to win the game. Right. So you put the guys out there that you think give you the best shot to win the game. But that that it's it's a discipline issue and it goes all the way from the top. Right. I mean, you look at Grantham coming back. That's not holding somebody accountable for the way the defenses have played over the last couple of years, though. Again, you can't blame Grantham for this one. Um, but uh, it is ironic to me that Florida's offense carried the team all last year and they couldn't stop anybody. And the one time Florida's defense comes out and does everything that it should do, then the offense doesn't. And yeah, that seems to offense. be uh, yeah, offense just limitations. Was, offense was its big own biggest opponent today or on Saturday. Well, let's, let's move into four bits. You're starting to dip into it, but we wanted to talk about the conflicting dynamic and Mullen's approach to Emory Jones in that you seem like you got all the trust in the world in the guy. We didn't see a, a snap of Anthony Richardson in the second half. Uh, I believe you had pointed out in your article uh, this on Sunday morning here. Why not open things up more with Emory if he's the guy you're committed to? So forget the discussion. Everyone who's going to be in the comments screaming about it, it should be Anthony Richardson. Okay, cool. I think we're all on the same page about that from the fans' perspective. Dan Mullen's running the decisions, though, and he seems to be comfortable with the current setup. So Emory Jones is our guy. We got to roll forward with it. Why not let him take more downfield shots outside? Of, I, we were talking beforehand. I think I saw one. We saw that uh, comeback route with Henderson at about 20 yards. We saw a bunch of 15, 10 to 15 yard range passes. But the only shot downfield we saw was the pass interference to Copeland. And we know we got guys that are fully capable of, of stretching the field. Why not take make full use of this offense with Emory Jones if you have that much trust in them, Dan Mullen? So – in the article that I wrote, I said, is he unwilling or incapable of taking those downfield shots? And I, I don't have the all 22, so it's hard to go back and look at everything. But from the all 22 that I saw, there were opportunities for Florida to go downfield and Emory decided not to take them. Right. There was one where he had a rocker step and the pressure got there quickly. But he had the opportunity to throw the ball up, and instead he rolled back to his right, and even Whittemore came open at that point. But I, I don't think it's fair to ask him to find Whittemore in that particular situation. But what is fair is that he had exactly what he wanted, a single high safety, a rocker step. His, his wide receiver got behind the corner, and he didn't throw the ball up. And you know I'm sitting there going, okay, well, Mullen dialed up what he wanted, and he didn't throw the ball. And that I think is fundamentally an issue is that there's a delay in the ball coming out by the time it comes out, it, there's not time, there's not time or the separation is closed by the time the ball comes out. And then the other aspect of it is, you know, we all saw that interception. Malik Davis was coming wide open in the flat on that one. Kentucky just dropped a ton of coverage in that when the linebacker drops, it's actually the same thing I highlighted in my post game last week for Kentucky that, or for, for Tennessee, they ran a zone blitz. And uh, Jones was able to hit a little, a little post route, not post route, sort of a little crossing route to Naquan Wright coming across the middle. And he threw it, even though the linebacker dropped back into that zone. And I, I wasn't sure whether he saw the linebacker 
and thought, oh, I can fit it in, or whether he just didn't see the linebacker. And I think the interception this week sort of indicates he just didn't see the linebacker last week and happened to fit it in there. And this week he wasn't able to fit it in there. And and that's the other thing, right, is that if you don't have confidence in yourself as a quarterback, are you going to let it go? And if the coaching staff doesn't have confidence that you're going to get it to the guy who actually is in one-on-one coverage, that you're going to be able to read the coverage correctly, then you can't take those deep shots. It's funny, the deep shot for the pass interference for Copeland, he wasn't even looking at the line of scrimmage. Like the, the snap came from McGuckwin and he wasn't, he wasn't ready. <laughs> and I almost wonder whether in that case he had to go with his instinct and he throws the ball deep down the sideline because that's what this coverage sort of dictated. It, it looks like things are moving a little, like the, that the gears are turning and there's some hesitation. And in that case, I think he kind of got caught where he did, where he couldn't hesitate, right? The ball comes, it's a shock. He happened to catch it. I don't even know how he caught it. And he drops back and his first read is, is that one down the sideline. It's open, throw it, pass interference. And all of a sudden that drive's going pretty, pretty, pretty strongly. But, you know, I, it's interesting if you, if you go back and look at it, Anthony Richardson was actually a key on a bunch of their scoring drives. I mean, he started out the touchdown drive with an 11 yard run, kind of got that, that one moving um, on the field goal drive. He basically, they got the ball, I think at like the 11 or 12 yard line, he drove them all the way to midfield. And then they had the targeting replay and they took him off the field. Though It looked like he popped right up after that, after that hit, but then Emory Jones is there on like a third and four, third and five completes it across the middle. That one was to right, I believe. And then, you know, Florida's drive stalls and they kick a field goal. Um, so you know, he's an incomplete player is really what it boils down to. His QB ratings, 129. His yards above replacement was negative 0.08. So even though he ran for 63 yards, you know, averaging six and a half yards per attempt just isn't that much. Um, so there are things he's doing on a individual play basis that you go, that's a nice play. But when you put it all and aggregate it together, it's really not it's really not effective quarterback play. It's just sort of average and that's what we're getting. So I, I don't know what you can, I mean, it is what it is at this point. It's five games in, you know, five starts throwing the ball, you know, 27 times, three times, 22 times, one time, 31 times against Kentucky. We got 134 attempts now to evaluate six and a half yards per attempt. He's averaging 6.3 yards per attempt rushing. So, you know, you're almost better off letting him run the ball then you are letting him throw the ball and you just don't win in college football these days with that kind of disparity. Yeah. On, on the final drive, Will, if you go back and look at, and by the way, I do want to correct my our, ourselves here. I think Anthony Richardson did play a little bit in the second half. I, I just saw a note I had. Um, I think I he had, he had on one that. run and then there was a, there was yeah. an offsides for Kentucky and he threw sort of a worm burner into the ground. Yeah, it wasn't, he didn't play much. He didn't play much in the second half. Uh, we saw him a little more in the first half, but uh, on the final drive, if you go back and you watch that, that first, he, he gets a, a pass to Gamble for f- about 15 yards. He completes the pass at 12. Copeland picks up a few more in the next play. And uh, the, he completes another pass to Copeland, three passes in a row, and then he runs down inside the Kentucky 10. So he had a great spell up until that goal line situation where, like you said, inside that those red zone, uh, uh, red zone struggles. But there's a couple other situations I want to talk about before we move on to the next topic here. The first one being the, the where we talk about Mullen going back and forth here with Richardson comes in and it, he, he actually leads a, a nice drive down to about midfield. He takes that hit. It's third and four. And Mullen decides to put Emory Jones in after there was a stoppage to review the play for targeting. Why? Why go to Emory at that point where Richardson had so cleanly moved the team down the field? And then they end up settling for the field goal on that drive. This is the field goal drive I'm referencing right now. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, well, I actually, so I do know, right? So if you look at what Anthony Richardson has been asked to do this year, he's got seven deep throws over 20 yards. Everything else is behind the line of scrimmage. So he's three of four for 12 yards behind the line of scrimmage. He's four of seven for 188 yards going downfield. So from zero to 10 and 11 to 20 yards. Oh, I'm sorry. He's got one, one attempt for on the right-hand side from 11 to 20 yards. So when you think about where he has some sort of strength, it is not in the middle of the field. It is not those short to intermediate routes. Now, when you look at Emory Jones, well, now all of a sudden you've got a completely different dichotomy where in considerably more attempts, he's two for nine 
and 20 plus yards. So think about that. Richardson has seven deep shots. Emory Jones has nine deep shots and Emory Jones throwing the ball like 130 times and Anthony Richardson's throwing it like 12. And so, so what does this tell us about where, where they think he's effective? And so that, you know, just to the left-hand side from zero to 10 yards, he's 12 of 16 in the middle, 10 of 15, right-hand side, 17 of 26. So you're talking, you know, geez, like 50 attempts there between zero and 10 yards out of 134 total. And then you're talking 20, 37 attempts between 11 and 20 yards. And then a bunch of stuff behind the line of scrimmage for different screens and things like that. So I think that when they have a third down and manageable, they don't trust Anthony Richardson to be able to convert that one in anything other than, you know, it turns into a, the read isn't correct. And then it turns into more of a street ball play where he's out there running around trying to make the play. And if you think he didn't look as dynamic yesterday, running the ball, I still think some of that is that, you know, just didn't get many opportunities. You can't, it's kind of unfair to expect him to average 36 yards a rush or something. There are just going to be times where there's going to be somebody there and he's not going to be able to deke him, deke him out of the way. But, um, but I think when you look at it, the strengths of these guys, if you could combine the strengths of Emory Jones with the strengths of Anthony Richardson, you would have a quarterback who just drives everybody crazy but they don't have that, right? They've got a guy who either goes deep or throws screens and they got a guy who's sort of intermediate, but, but doesn't go deep. And so that combination means that the defense can actually play both guys differently. You actually saw that yesterday that, that Kentucky was playing that three, two, six, where they were kind of pretending like they were going to play coverage against Emory Jones. And then they were running the safeties in right at the snap to, to sort of backfill um, to allow their linebackers to stay outside for different read options and things like that. And they didn't do that against Anthony Richardson. When Anthony Richardson was in there, they played a much more straight up defense. And I think the reason was, is that they knew that if Anthony Richardson had an opportunity, he was going to pull the trigger and he was going to go deep. They didn't have, they didn't have any concerns that Emory Jones was going to do that. And it showed. So why why not when you have approximately two minutes left before halftime and you get your ball the ball at your own thirteen yard line, you get a first down and you're sitting at your own twenty three. Why do you let the clock just tick down? Maybe that's a time to give Anthony Richardson a shot to take it take a deep ball there. Because you're an idiot. I don't know. There there's no other. Tell that me is, why Will Dan Mullen does things. Will tell me why Dan Mullen does things. It's what, what? so, <laughs> it, it's so awful. So Emory Jones actually played really well in the first half. He was ten of eleven, 105 yards, averaging nine and a half yards in attempt. He he had been shut down running the ball four for fourteen. But the thing that flummoxes me about that entire thing is so Cox gets the or not Cox Carter gets the sack with like two and a half. It's like two minutes and fifty seconds, right? So if you want to run the ball, you still have the opportunity. If you call some timeouts, you can run the ball, especially if you get some first downs. They don't call timeouts. So it runs down to like a minute and 50 or something like that. Then they get the ball and they decide to throw it two straight times. They throw a little screen out into the out in the flat. Okay, well, that's in the flat. That's kind of a running play. That's reasonably safe. But then they throw it over the middle to Whittemore. And that one was a much more hairy throw and something where if it had been a little bit behind him or if, it had, mm-hmm. if he had gotten hit and it had fluttered, all of a sudden you have a pick six going the other direction. So you're like, okay, well, they're going to be somewhat aggressive. They just wanted to save their timeouts because they're going to run a little bit down the field and, you know, they're going to need those because they're going to try to get in position for a field goal. But no, then they ran, then they ran Malik Davis two straight times or Damian Pierce. I can't remember two straight times, got another first down, actually never called timeout and just let the clock run out. So there's a couple of things here. One is if you just want to let the clock run out, take a knee. Because there's zero risk you're going to turn the ball over if you take a knee. There's zero risk you're going to get somebody injured if you're going to take a knee. And so if you're really that concerned that your offense is sort of out of sorts, then take a knee. If you're also just trying to get in at halftime, run the ball because because running the ball is more safe than passing the ball. And so the fact that they came out and threw it, those first two is just completely mind boggling to me. And then the fact that they didn't actually try to go down the field. And the other thing is, is you're sitting there at the end of the game, just begging for extra time. Right. I mean, it would have been great. It, so they get that touchdown. They're still down by, or you know, if they get the touchdown, make the extra point, it's 20 to 20. You still would have wanted the extra time. That extra three points would have been really valuable there. You come out with the win, you bleed the clock all the way down and you have an opportunity to, to really take advantage. Instead they don't. And you know, the, the reality is, is on the road in the SEC, you can't turn down points. You can't make horrible calls like not going for it on fourth and two from your own or from Kentucky's 42. Um, you know, those sorts of things were pervasive. And, and it's, uh, it's not just 
like the 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 switching the quarterbacks in and out drives me crazy. Like give a guy a drive, don't give a guy a drive, or switch them in and out when you're gonna run and when you're gonna throw, like you did Tebow and Leak. So don't let it. Why is Anthony Richardson in there on first and ten? Bring him in on third and two and let him run the ball. That's what they used to do with Tebow, but they're not doing that with Richardson. They're letting him be in on first and ten, letting him go for four or five plays, and then they bring in Jones to to bail him out which just doesn't seem like an efficient use of either guy's skills. Great. You bring up a good point. Maybe he would have more, uh, the would more pass scared him off before the half. Maybe he's like, well, we got lucky on that one. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll take it in, but like going into, but he half, didn't call a timeout after the sack. Like say, that, there was three, three timeouts in your pocket going into halftime is very un Dan Mullen. Like, and, and, and I'm glad you brought up that punt from the UK 41 is fourth and three first drive of the game. When does Dan Mullen ever punt that ball, Will? I don't know. He, he came in it's thinking. very unusual game for him. He came in clearly thinking that if they avoided mistakes, that they were going to be able to take advantage in the fourth quarter and be more physical. And it turns out that, you know, when your team just continues to shoot itself in the face, like you, you, can't, you can't just show up and expect to win. You have to show – your game plan has to be solid. He got outcoached. Very clearly by Stoops. Stoops' defensive game plan was awesome. Stoops has the same limitations, if not more so, at the quarterback position than Florida does. Levis was awful, just awful. But seven, when they had seven of 17 for 87 yards. But when it was third and two and they needed a first down, they decided to do play action, hard play action, roll him out. And he threw a duck and, you know, turned into an incompletion. But I think the indication is, is that we're not going to only give the ball to Rodriguez and play scared that at the end of the day, we're going to need to convert a couple of first downs to get this win. And we're willing to be aggressive to do it. And when the opposing team is willing to be aggressive, then you don't know what's coming. So from a defensive perspective on that last drive, Florida knows that Kentucky's not just going to sit and prevent the whole time because Stoops has already announced he went for it on fourth down, like on the first play of the fourth quarter. Um, you know, they, they were coming after kicks, obviously. And so, you know, they had announced they were going to be aggressive. They were going to be the aggressors. And, you know, you want to know why all those false starts happened? It's because everybody knew that that there was a possibility that Kentucky was coming after it every time there was a third down. And, and that's because of an aggression that Florida just didn't have. Still, still trying to wrap my head around this one with the, with the lack of aggressiveness. That's just, I, I think that's the opposite of what we've seen from Dan Mullen in so many situations. He's usually very aggressive and very willing to uh, go for the right call. Typically, he typically makes the, the right call in those situations. So I think you're right, though. I think he did want to lean back on on his uh, maybe feel like play field position with this Kentucky offense where he felt like he had a good matchup with his defense, which he was right about because we'll kick it over here to six bits. And let's talk about the Kentucky stats on on, uh, on the Florida defense last night here, Will. We only saw 13 first downs, one of nine of third down, 0 for 1 on fourth down, nice fourth and two stop where you had half the Gators defense meeting Rodriguez at the line. Uh, 87 yards passing on the night. I mentioned seven completions total for the night, 137 yards on the ground on 30 attempts and uh, one interception by Travis Johnson. We saw the disaster early on, uh, on the screenplay with Wondell Robinson, where, man, if you guys want to see a block, go watch Cavassier smoke blocking on the outside i i believe it was was it uh johnson on the outside who just got absolutely laid out on that play will i mean just just a brutal play uh diabate overflowed a little bit to the outside because i think he was thinking that robinson was gonna cut it out outside instead he goes inside and two safeties just missed tackles flat out trey dean made a horrendous effort on a tackle embarrassing effort on that play and uh and Torrance just was he's kind of lunging a little bit didn't quite get there uh Robs takes it up the middle for that touchdown outside of that though we didn't see the multitude of broken plays like we've seen over time but that one broken play obviously that, that does constitute a difference in the game 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess. Look, I mean, Florida's defense has been susceptible to big plays pretty much all season. They gave up, I think I had it at like 15, 20 plus yard plays um, over the first four games of the season, 13 of them through the air. So you yep. knew one was coming at some point. Robinson breaks that one. They actually hit Josh Ali on that same drive for a 15 yarder on sort of a little slant or, or, or a little screen. I can't remember what it was, but it was nothing far from the line of scrimmage. So for the rest of the game, other than that drive, Kentucky threw for 31 yards. Wow. And, you know, you look at the way the defense played, obviously they gave up that one big play. So they, they gave up seven yards per play in the first quarter, but 41 of that 41 of the 105 is the play to Robinson. They gave up 3.0 in the second quarter, 4.8 in the third quarter, 3.4 in the fourth quarter. Every time Florida's offense needed the ball back, they gave it right back to him. Um, the only time they couldn't hold up was after the interception that Emory Jones gave. There were a few kind of weird plays there. The, the bad snap to Levis where he picks it up. It looked like Ravon Dexter was running a stunt, which is really weird on like a third and three that they would have the defensive tackle running a stunt. Mm-hmm. But, you know, again, I, I – like I'm not going to say anything bad about the defense. I came in thinking the defense was going to struggle. I came in thinking that when there was an opportunity for Kentucky to run the ball, to put the game away, they were going to be able to do it. I was actually expecting that to be what happened when they were up 20 to 13 and they got the ball back with five or six minutes. I was like, Oh no, this is going to be one of these where they just sort of bleed the clock. Florida uses all of its timeouts, gets the ball back with like 45 seconds. And then, you know, you got Emory Jones trying to chuck the ball down the field, which wouldn't have been successful. Instead, the defense got it right back. I think gave up one first down, but got the ball back with, you know, four, four and a half minutes. And then, I mean, the the topic then was, is Florida going to leave Kentucky too much time as they were driving down the field, um, trying to score that tying touchdown as opposed to, as opposed to were they, you know, were they going to not have enough time to score? So defense did a fantastic job. I mean, look, you got the one play to, to Robinson, but you gave up 20 points and, Seven of them weren't your fault. And yep. really, 14 of them weren't your – or I guess, yeah, well, the, 13 the seven, of them weren't your fault because they missed the extra point after the after the kick. But The final touchdown, the Kentucky scored the, that on that Rodriguez touchdown, that was set up by the Emory Jones interception too. Yep. So, I mean, it's, the defense really – they had themselves at night. It's the first time I've really seen that in a while. Um, I'm not sure how explosive this Kentucky offense is, but – when you, when you talk about, I mean, is this Kentucky offense, are we going to watch them play Georgia and we're going to be doing a Vanderbilt thing where it's like more yards to points comparison in the fourth quarter here? I mean, I don't think it'll be. I don't, I, don't, defense. I don't think it'll be as bad as Vanderbilt, but I think they're going to get murdered. I, I, I think it's going to be ugly. Um, yeah, I, I think what we learned this weekend, because I, I thought Old Miss was going to beat Alabama. And I, I I was harping on it all week, and you kept looking at me like I was crazy. I thought I they were like, going to cover. I thought Corral was going to have a big day. I was I was uh, looking forward to that game. This well, and it turns out like they they missed that first fourth down attempt in the red zone, and then Alabama just decided it's time to shut the door. We're going to shut these guys up right away. Mm-hmm. And, and I think what we learned is that Alabama and Georgia are, are head and tails above the rest. And I think we learned that maybe Alabama kind of rested on its laurels when it got up twenty one to three against Florida, and uh, you know that it's impressive that Florida was able to come back the way they did, but that um, if Alabama had really, I think Alabama may have learned and showed that they learned against old Miss that you can step on the opponent's throat though. Saban's not going to be happy that it wound up 42 to 21. So I, yeah, as we watch Kentucky go through the year, I, I don't think you can be one dimensional against the Nick, against the Nick Saban or a Kirby smart team. And I think that's really the problem that Florida is going to have when they go play Kirby smart is that, you know, Mark Stoops essentially said, I'm going to take away the thing you do well, which is that your quarterbacks keep running for 150 yards a game. I'm going to take that away and we'll see what you can do if you don't have that. And so Emory Jones runs for 63 yards on 13 carries, but a bunch of that was on the last couple of drives. I mean, he was, he was at like, he was at like eight carries for like 24 yards there going into the, or like 34 yards going into those last couple of drives. He took away the thing Florida wanted to do, and Florida couldn't adjust off of it. I think you're going to see that when Georgia plays Kentucky, they're going to take away the thing that that Kentucky wants to do, make Levis beat them, and, and that can get ugly real quick. Yeah, and really, uh, Wondell Robinson, we saw him take a couple shots to Ali and Epps, but other than that, that's not that's not a deep passing game. So, But still, credit to – especially you're without Kyrie Elam, right? He's out with an injury. We saw Marshall – I, I thought Marshall had some nice plays. He had that. We saw him come up on the uh, on a screen pass and just crush the guy in the backfield. On, on, on just as soon as he caught the ball, Marshall was on top of him. And then just great coverage one-on-one with w- Wondell Robinson down the sideline. 
uh, when Kentucky was threatening late. He tackled him two on one. That was pretty good. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I, I think pass interferences were a concern of mine coming into this game that the, that the defense has been pretty undisciplined when it comes to really getting your eyes on the ball when, when guys got, are going deep. Got away with see, one. Got, got away, away with one. one, but still just one, right? Like it yeah. wasn't like six of them. Um, you know, you look at the penalties. There were 15 penalties. How many of them were really on the defensive side? I don't remember a ton. There wasn't anybody jumping off sides. There weren't any stupid like face masks or late hits or or roughing the passer or anything like that. I thought Amari Bernie played really well. There were a bunch of throws out of the flat. There was one where Bernie just picked the guy up like a WWE wrestler, and just took him down mm-hmm. on on like a third and 13 or something and was there for it. And really sort of the same play that, Tennessee scored on last week <laughs> and he diagnosed the screen and was able to get there and take him down. So yeah, I mean, look, man, they, they, they gave up what six points total when you factor in the not having the outside, the outside things. I mean, the, you get the, you got the blocked field goal and then you've got the turnover by Emory Jones. That's 13 of the 20. So they gave up seven, right? So they gave up the seven points, the one big play to Robinson and that's it. And I mean, if you'd have told me that Florida's defense was only responsible for seven points, I would have told you I'm really wrong picking Kentucky to cover this one. Um, yeah. Offense well, didn't do his job. Are you seeing, so are you seeing improvement on the defense so far here through five games? Uh, yeah. I mean, the defense is a lot better than it was last year. I think, I, I think that, um, there's still obviously places to grow. I think the, the big plays are concerning because Kentucky hasn't really had a lot of those. Um, but I think the defensive line is the strength, and that's one of the things that um, you sort of looked at in this one and said that this is where Florida is going to get tested, but also an opportunity for Florida to differentiate themselves where they will um, – where they'll be if – if they were able to stop Rodriguez, you figured Levis wouldn't kill him and they'd be, they'd be effective. And that's what they did, right? Rodriguez ran for 99 yards. There were some times where it felt like every time he got the ball, he was getting six or seven yards, but then Kentucky would drop a pass out in the flat or, or Levis would take a sack or something like that. And, and it would, and it would kill a drive. Same thing really that we were seeing for Florida on the offensive side of the ball as well. Kentucky's just not that consistent on that side. And when you have a team that's relatively inconsistent, the Florida defense is going to, is able to take advantage. Um, I actually, it's interesting. I'm not sure that Florida is going to see another team that doesn't have those consistency problems. Even when you talk about George, I think George's defense is the reason people are, are concerned about them and the offensive side of the ball. Yeah. They look good against Arkansas. They've looked good against some of the other opponents that they've had. Um, but is the consistency going to be there when they're playing a team that's got at least roughly equivalent talent? That's still something we'll have to see. Yeah. Bringing up Georgia, it makes this loss it hurt even more because we're going to sit there watching that game. It, there's no chance to even play spoiler, really. I mean, Georgia can lose the game, go to the SEC title, and be fine. I I don't know, man. It's rough. It's rough. It's rough. But I'll tell you what. Good things from the defense yesterday. I think we've seen encouraging progress from that side of the ball, at least. And if the offense showed up and did its job, the defense definitely put you in position to win uh, yesterday, which is a lot different than what we've seen. And, Will, before we finish up here, go to a dollar – I do want to bring up just – I just want to work in – it's a little bit out of segment here, but let's just talk about that block punt for a moment where you had Pascal uh, break through the middle. He just kind of slipped through his two – two uh, the two guys blocking up front and got his big hands up and the ball went straight up in the air. Just a freak play, lands right in the guy's hands on the run, takes it straight down the sideline. Kentucky scores that touchdown that, um, you know – Again, talk about a play that's a difference in the game right there. I think that's the defining play of the game. Field goal, field goal, not punt. But the, oh, I said punt, um, I meant field goal. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, so field yeah, goal. I mean, this, this is always one of those things, right, is that you know that the field goal unit is not designed to chase a guy down the sidelines. And so if you have the opportunity to get one of those, it can turn into a big play, even if he hadn't gone the whole way. You know, it still is a huge deal to be able to have a three-point swing, but to turn it into a nine-point swing is 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 a big deal there and, and just completely lit up the Kentucky sideline. You sort of heard them – you, know, you heard the commentator talking about how they were mad about all the penalties and getting discouraged and those sorts of things. And then all of a sudden it completely changes the momentum, changes the way they're feeling about the game and gets them all juiced up to be able to go out there and, and win the game. And considering that Mullen's entire plan appeared to be that he was just going to basically try to get out to a three to six point lead and kind of milk it the whole way. It was like the Mississippi state game plan from 2018. It was a bunch of screens to the outside. It was, we're going to run the ball. We're going to have half field reach for our quarterbacks. We're going to punt and play field position and we're going to win um, ugly in 
in, in a game like that. The difference is that they didn't have the big play. That game they had Kadarius Tony on the throwback, that Kodak play that they ran last week against Tennessee. They had that play against Mississippi State, which was the difference in that game. This year they didn't have that. In fact, it was interesting. And that Mississippi State game was a deep pass from Nick Fitzgerald. Hit his wide receiver right in the face mask and right out of the half. And if Mississippi State makes that play, I think it's a very different game. I think I think the Bulldogs probably win. Um, and then the next drive, Florida goes down and, and Kadarius Tony hits that touchdown pass and all of a sudden Florida's up and the game has a completely different dynamic. So this game, playing safe, playing playing ugly and you have that one play go the wrong direction and and that's that's the difference right your margin for error is extraordinarily small when you play that conservatively and so their margin for error was small yes it's a little bit unlucky but you know special teams has been bad all year and so you know you got the you got the um, drop by Jamarcus Weston that puts him at the one yard line against Alabama. You've got the missed extra point against Alabama. There have been penalties on special teams all year long. We haven't had any sort of kickoff returns, no blocks, no, no, you know, th- there just hasn't been anything that's been good that's really happened on special teams that you can point to all year long. And so the fact that we're now getting bit by those sorts of things, I don't think is a surprise. I, you know, I look at it and I say, yeah, we haven't been very good at that all year long. Why would we expect it to be good now? Yeah, we'll put that 30 for 30 documentary together. What if I told you that an extra point and a field goal were the only things between the Florida Gators and an undefeated record in 2021? Yeah, Florida would be 5 and off. They just graded things based on yardage. <laughs> they beat Alabama in yardage too. Oh, man. All right, man, let's go to a dollar. Where do we go from here? That's the simplest question of this entire episode here, Will. Simple yet... There might be some layers to it. I, you know, Twitter, half of Twitter wants to fire Dan Mullen. Uh, that's utterly ridiculous. So we'll put that one to bed right now. I understand the frustrations with Dan Mullen at times. Like, it seems like we've had one of these games every – I mean, I as soon as this game ended, I texted you. I'm like, I, I think I said, put this right in the same class as LSU and a and last year where you just walked away with just like a completely dissatisfied feeling about the performance where – you feel like we were probably the better team and we didn't come out on top. I, I feel like you're going to be, and you could probably point to a couple other games from the mullet era where it's like that, where it's what, what do we got to do to show up week in and week out right now? And I think that's the part that's really baffling and got a lot of people frustrated. And I believe me, I'm a huge Dan Mullen fan. I, I've been a Dan Mullen defender on a lot of things. Um, I, I think you're pretty tough on him at times, Will, but I think that at the end of the day, there's a really high expectation here and losing to Kentucky will get some voices uh, uh, pretty shrill pretty quickly. Yeah. I mean, look, I think there, yes, I am tough on Mullen, but I'm tough on Mullen because he talks about the Gator standard and the Gator standard is SEC championships and national championships. And you don't win national championships by losing to Kentucky. Just point blank, right? That loss last night, even if they had beaten Alabama, probably puts them out of competition for a national title or a playoff berth because of what it means. In fact, it probably puts them in a position where they would struggle maybe to even win the East, right? Because if Kentucky goes and loses to Georgia, but then ran the rest of the, ran the rest of it, you know, let's say even Georgia dropped another one, they still would have the inside track on the SEC East over Florida. You you can't lose to Kentucky. It's just, you can't, nobody else in Florida history loses to Kentucky and Mullins now lost twice. So that's the first thing. The other thing is, is that I am hard on Mullen because of his recruiting. There's no excuse from a recruiting perspective to lose to Kentucky. Kentucky recruits in the 25 to 35 range nationally, sort of eighth, ninth, 10th in the SEC every year. Florida, even when, even when they're sub elite recruiting under Mullen, even under sub elite recruiting under McElwain, the recruiting is better than Kentucky. So Florida has better athletes. And and the reality is, is you got to be able to take advantage of that. But the reason that we pay attention to recruiting or the reason I pay attention to recruiting is because recruit and let's be honest, recruiting drives numbers like crazy. The reason it drives numbers like crazy is because it's hope that people look at the recruits and they say, my program isn't where it needs to be yet. But this guy, this recruit, this five-star, this set of four stars is going to bring us to where we need to be. That's why people look at recruiting. And the hope with Dan Mullen has always been that he's going to be the guy who's going to win you the game on the field, even when your players aren't as good. And that got burst last night. Like I look at that and I go, that game should have been won. And had we had a different coach, we probably win it. And that's the thing that I think sort of has the fan base 
up in arms a little bit is that the promise was that you were never going to have that sort of thing happen. And it seems like we have those sorts of hiccups every year. Now you can point to 2018, you know, the hiccup against Kentucky. That was Grantham's defense. Couldn't stop anybody. You got Felipe Franks out there. He threw the ball like 38 times. He, you know, Franks isn't the right guy for Mullen's system. Okay. Right. Then you go Kentucky to the Missouri game. He was also game. very good that year too. Sure. But then, but, then, but then you go to the Missouri game who weren't all that great that year. And, and Franks was terrible. And, and really if, if Kyle Trask hadn't gotten injured, he would have, you know, in practice that week, Trask would have taken over after that Missouri game. If that South Carolina game where they had the big comeback sort of changes everything around, they beat Florida state, they finished 10 and three, they beat Michigan in the bowl game, but there were underlying cracks that whole way through, but, but there are reasons you can make excuses there. Right. You go to 20, 19 and they win every game they should though the Kentucky game a lot of people were pointing this out yesterday that that Kentucky game they lose if Felipe Frank stays in that game most likely because it looked like he was just struggling and you know you don't want to see the guy get injured but let's be honest the truth is when Kyle Trask came in there the dynamic completely changed Mm -hmm. then you go to 2020 and you've got the A&M loss which was rough but I still think A&M at least deserved to win I mean they were going up and down the field just like Florida was then you've got the LSU loss which was completely inexcusable You've got the time management issues against Alabama that were really bad. And then you've got the just they didn't even show up for the game against Oklahoma. So that's sort of what's percolating in the background. But the thing that's percolating in the background is we still have Dan Mullen. We're still going to score 35 points a game. Todd Grantham's the problem. Now you have this game and this game, Todd Grantham's defense showed up. Todd Grantham's defense played well. Dan Mullen's offense completely laid an egg. And so the guy that we looked at coming into the season, I've said it multiple times, wasn't worried about the offense. Well, I mean, now I'm worried about the offense. You just put up 13 points on the road against Kentucky. Couldn't snap the ball without getting a false start. You played ultra conservative the entire game, like scared, you know, two and a half minutes left. You're scared to try to drive at the end of the first half when you're ahead. That, you know, so where does my hope come from if I'm a Florida fan who was saying, I recognize all of the numbers on the recruiting side aren't in our favor, but when Mullen gets Kirby where he wants him with close talent, that the offense is going to take over because he's, he's a skilled guy on the field. Now, I still think Mullen has that in him, but every year we have one of these hiccups against a team that is inferior and some of that may be that you can't just go out there and roll the ball out when your team isn't heads and shoulders more talented than everybody else. But part of it is at least yesterday, the coach completely handcuffed his team and didn't let them be the superior athletes, right? Two and a half minutes left. You just say, no, let's go to the locker room. Well, you just gave up an opportunity to score. And, you know, I, the one thing I have never really bought into was, you know, I think Mike Griffith said that after the Alabama game, that Urban Meyer and Steve Spurrier would have won that game. Yeah. Those are two of the best coaches in the history of the game. Maybe they win that game. And Mullen's really good, but the problem is, is that the, the problem isn't that Spurrier and Meyer would have won that game. The problem is, is that they would have gone for the jugular and not going for the jugular against Kentucky, let them stay in the game. Kentucky gets the block block field goal. All of a sudden it's a completely different game and it flips. So um, where do we go from here? I, I, I think part of it is, is that we need to know what we have at various places, not just at the quarterback position, though that's obviously the one that's on the, on the fronts of everybody's minds. I think Dan Mullen is going to have to show, um, show some faith in these guys and have them go out there and try some things that maybe they're not completely comfortable with. And, you know, there's going to have to be some accountability for the guys who don't perform. Um, I, I think, you know, I would love to say recruiting needs to get better, but I think it is what it is at this point. It's going to be what it is. Um, and, and so you're going to have to, you're going to have to make things work with what you've got. Now, the other thing is, is that urban Meyer is really the only guy who consistently put up 13 to one seasons. Um, even if you go back to Steve Spur, you go back to 99 and two, 10 and two and 91, nine and four, 11 and two, 10 and two, then 12 and one, 12 and one and 95 and 96, then 10 and two, 10 and two, nine and four, 10 and three, 10 and two before Zook comes, Zook takes over and goes eight and five, eight and five, seven and five. And then, and then Meyer obviously comes in and has his run. So two losses for the Florida program is not an abnormal number of losses for this team. Right. And so if you win out, you beat Georgia and you maybe are able to sneak into the, you know, JT Daniels maybe continues to be day to day for the rest of the season. Georgia drops another game because somebody figured, 
figures out how to guard Stetson Bennett. And, uh, you know, Georgia drops another one. You're able to beat Georgia. Maybe Kentucky drops a game or two, and you're able to get into the SEC championship game. You still have a successful season. I think you can even have a successful season if you don't get to the SEC championship game. If you find out things about your team that prepare you for 2022. But, you know, the, the problem that I think most people have is that their suspicion was that the recruiting wasn't enough. But the hope was that Mullen was going to be able to X and O around that. And Mullen just got beaten directly X and O's by Mark Stoops. And, and that's a little bit disheartening. Another, another piece I'll add to that is this, the whole off season, people would talk about the cotton bowl and Dan Mullen's approach to the cotton bowl. I mean, we, we were making cracks about the yardage comment that Mullen made last night. Maybe like the, we shouldn't take anything he says 45 minutes after a loss very seriously going forward. We should probably just make that a general standard rule. That should be a part of the Gator standard. When Mullen talks right after a loss, let him just have his press conference and we'll get back to him like Monday or Tuesday. Well, from uh, everything I understand, the PR people had like a hook and we're like trying to yank him <laughs> off stage. <laughs> so yeah, another talking. thing. It's like, all right, Uncle Dan, that's enough. That's enough. <laughs> but I, I, I think like you look at the thing and I got a kick out of the way he handled the cotton ball. I know a lot of people were upset about that last year where, hey, look, I was pretty disgusted at the performance, but when he comes out and he's like, yeah, you know, we're missing all these guys. Like, he, he's just the guy that says the thing that you're not supposed to actually say. Like, we all know. We all know that was the case. We didn't literally need to hear that from you, Dan Mullen, though. And, and that, that's the part that I got a kick out of a little bit where I was just, what is he doing? And so all off season, like when I, I think like Gators breakdown with you and Dave, like something about the Cotton Bowl came up, and I'd always say, "Well, if Dan Mullen says it doesn't count, then it doesn't count, and it doesn't." And, and like you, you can make a joke about it one time, but here we are now, sitting in early October with our second loss in tow, completely out of the playoff picture. Even if we somehow run the table, we are very likely out of the playoff picture at this point. Dan Mullen, you went to the Cotton Bowl last year. That's a good bowl game. That's a very good bowl game. You played Oklahoma. That's an enticing matchup. You didn't take it seriously at all. So why should some Gator fans hold on right now when maybe they'll play Clemson in the Sugar Bowl or something like that when you didn't take Cotton Bowl with Oklahoma seriously? This is where the Cotton Bowl attitude from last year comes back to bite you a little bit because – you could sell this team still. Hey, you know, we do have a bunch of young guys. We're building toward 22 where we think we'll make our run. You know, stick with us. Be patient with the program. But you, when you, you put that performance on the field with the Cotton Bowl last year, this is the full circle, I think, where it comes back to bite you a little bit. I think I think the people who are still upset with that game, I, I think you're going to have a tough time reeling in. Like, I mean, look, we're all, at the end of the day, we're all true Gator fans here. Like, we're going to show up. I still got the hat on. We're going to be at the games. We're going to be watching every game. But uh, I, I don't know. I think that's where the Cotton Bowl loss comes back and starts to bite you a little bit. It was the second half of 2021. Yeah, I mean, so look, I, I think that, that – In terms the, of the attitude of the fan base, for the record, just so it, we're clear on that. Well, and the attitude of the analysts, too, I think. Because I, 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 I sympathize with people who feel that way, right? When Mullen, when Mullen came in, I was, it's funny, I got, I got criticized very heavily for writing something about the spring game. People call me Gramps because I didn't like the way that they, that they treated the spring game. But I thought that the lack of seriousness and the way that spring game was exhibited was something that Nick Saban would not have tolerated and guys like even Dave Swinney and Jimbo Fisher wouldn't necessarily have tolerated. Um, you know, you come in and, and the idea is, is it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, everybody gets a trophy party. It's a, you guys got your butt kicked last year. It's time to be better. And then he started talking about how the, the fans needed to fill the swamp before they even started winning games. I'm like, well, that's not the way this works, right? Like the way it works is, is that we've been filling the swamp for years and years and years and watching crappy football. And the expectation is you're going to deliver good football and we're still going to show up, but don't tell us we're not supporting the program because we are supporting the program. And, and he, and you're right. He does that from time to time and cheapening of the cotton bowl last year means that there obviously is a very large segment of the, of the fan base that says, well, if you get back to the cotton bowl, why am I going? Why do I care? Yeah, who's going to pay to go that? Well, and, and it, but again, I think when we talk about moving things forward, this is less about the cotton bowl and more about finding out who's going to be the guy who gets you to the playoffs. Right. That, that, that's what this is, is that this is a and, and I think it's legitimate to, to expect Mullen. I think it's OK for Mullen to have a down year. 
I mean, look at what the down year is up in Tallahassee, right? A down year in Tallahassee is they beat Syracuse and we're sitting there going, oh, now they'll go two and 10. Right? Like, like that, that's what the Syracuse win means for means for Florida State. You look at what's going on with Miami. I mean, you know, we wouldn't have lost to Appalachian State. They beat them by what, two? Who, who'd they lose to this week? Miss field Virginia. goal against Virginia. Like we're not losing to Virginia, though. I don't know. Kentucky might be sort of on par with them, you know, sort of long term. But you know, the, the the state is in shambles, and Florida is the is the beacon in the state. But that's not the beacon in the SEC, and we want them to be the beacon in the SEC. So 2021 is really now about building into how do you become that beacon in the SEC. And here's the reality: is we've seen five games of Emory Jones, and he is a average to slightly above average quarterback right he can do some things well he does some things not so well I don't think that you develop a quarterback into an elite quarterback from what we've seen these first five games that's that's unfortunate I wish that I could say he has the ability to grow into a guy who's elite but I don't see it I don't see it in the stats and I don't see it in the film Anthony Richardson has shown that he might have the ability to be a transcendent type quarterback. Now, maybe he can be, maybe he can't, but you have to find out in 2021, because if you walk into 2022 and then try to tell the fan base that Anthony Richardson wasn't able to complete it, complete the pass that he needed to in a road game against Tennessee or something early in the season, we're all going to sit there and go, well, you had all last year to give him, <laughs> give him the experience that you chose not to. And you think people are mad today. Well, just wait until you've sacrificed another season because you didn't find those things out. And I think it's the same thing in the secondary. You need to know is Marshall, your lockdown corner. You need to know who your safeties are. You need to know on the defensive line, can Dexter get what you need you need to know you know the young defensive tackles so valentino newkirk and truesdell have gotten an awful lot of time but guys like jalen lee and other and other guys at defensive tackle are going to need to get some time guys like zachary carter obviously can play defensive end but you need to know what chris bogle can bring you need to know what prince Liam and milan can bring those are the things that you're gonna have to find out over the course of the year and you can now because whether you finish nine and three eight and four ten and two at the end of the day you've basically said doesn't matter so what matters is making sure that next year you're 11 and one or 12 and out. I know we want Anthony Richardson to the fans. I'm talking from, from fan perspective that we want Anthony Richardson to start. Are we going to see that this year though? No, no, I don't think so. I, I think at the end of the day, there's, there's a trust level there with Emory Jones. I think there's a loyalty. We saw that with Todd Grantham as well. Um, I, I don't think we're going to see Anthony Richardson start, but he needs to play a lot. Right. I mean, I, I saw there was, I think it was Frank Frangi on Twitter today said that, you know, in the Vanderbilt game, he hopes that he sees sort of alternating series that Emory Jones gets the first series. Yeah. He starts, but then Anthony Richardson has the next and you just sort of go back and forth the entire game. Um, the problem with that is that if all of a sudden Florida scores 40 points when Anthony Richardson's out there and 17, when Emory Jones is out there, what do you do the next game? Right. I mean, at some point you're forced and your, your hand is forced if you put somebody in there who performs now, I think we all look at that and say, that's a good thing, but I don't know whether that's the way the staff sees it. And again, I, I we don't know what goes on behind the scenes. And the question is, um, you know, do the players think Anthony Richardson is the better option? Cause that's one thing is if the players are all fully behind Emory Jones and the work he's putting in and, and what he's doing to get prepared, then it's hard to make that change. I think if the players think Anthony Richardson is the way to win games and is the future, then that's when you'll see the change because they'll have to, because they need to maintain credibility with the guys who are there. Well, it'll be interesting down the stretch to see where we go from here. We got Vanderbilt coming into the swamp this week. Um, LSU on the road, it's typically a fun game. LSU just dropped to Auburn over the weekend. And, uh, and then you got that bye week in, in Georgia and Jacksonville. So if we can at least, you know, Maybe we're not ruining Georgia's life this year, but we can make it a little more difficult for them. That's still that's still fun. That's not that's not a terrible thing. But it's like they say, oh, well, come I, on, man. Like, like get a little bit excited. Like, I, like I'm bummed it, out right now, man. I, I had a rough weekend. I'm sorry. I, I, I just I was so looking forward to to a one loss Florida team going into Jacksonville and playing and playing this Bulldogs team and, and just breaking their hearts. And now we can only maybe ruin their day, not necessarily break their hearts. So that no, that see, I, see, I actually, I actually disagree because if you lose to this Florida team 
And if it's like one of those Treon games where they decide to like throw the ball like nine times and just run it down their throat and absolutely demolish them and sort of just grab their heart and pull it out of their chest, how do you then put that team in the playoff? So at this point, the value, if Dan Mullen beats Georgia and he ends up two and two against Georgia and he costs them an opportunity to make the playoff, everything's forgiven, man. I hate Georgia. So, you know, th- there is there is still hope for me in terms of being able to look at this and say, one, this is a, success- a successful season. And two, we can still have some fun. Let's go beat that Orgeron. Let's go beat the tar out of Vanderbilt. Let's go beat. Kirby smart. Let's get Kirby a couple of Kirby's before the season ends up. Cause Dan Mullen earned a giant Kirby this weekend. And you know, look, I mean, at the end of the day, this is supposed to be fun and three and two isn't where we want to be, but there's still a bunch of games. We only get 12 of these every year or 13. If you count the bowl game, got to go out and enjoy them. And when you get those rivalry games, even if you're two and two and eight, right? Like when you get into that cocktail party, if you win that game, it means something. And so I get it. I'm down after the game too, but I'm starting to come out of that a little bit. And, uh, you know, there, there's still some things at, at the end of the year, beating your rivals is still a big deal. So beat Florida state, beat Georgia, win a bowl game, get prepared and figure out what you got for 2022. You do those things. I'll say, okay, you had a down year in 2021. This was kind of a rebuilding year, losing pits, Tony and Trask. Let's move forward in 2022. If you just lay eggs from here on out because everybody gives up, then uh, then I think it's a different conversation. I was in school in in, in uh, 2007 when Tebow won the Heisman, and uh, that team had a ton of talent. We obviously know they're you know you're coming off the 06 championship, but it was a little bit of transition in terms of the starters. You had those Urban Meyer recruits stepping on the field and really taking over starting roles on that team. Uh, 2007 was a little bit of the training wheels. We saw them make mistakes and blow some games late in that one. I think uh, Auburn and LSU come to mind in particular, but uh, and then that Michigan Citrus Bowl or Capital One Bowl, that one was tough too. But hey, paid off in 2008. So maybe that's the hope going forward. But you'd like to see a strong finish from this team. They're certainly capable of it. I had full faith that we we're going to take care of business against Kentucky this weekend, though. And I, I, I'm still, you're coming out of it. I got a little more time, Will. I got. I need a little more time, man. So let's let's go pound Vandy this weekend, though. I'll be back. I'll be fully hyped up and uh, probably trying to talk myself into a Gators upset over Georgia at the end of the month, though. I'll be back on that. All right. Well, if you are like Nick and you've got zero interest or you're or you're sort of down. Our new sponsor is Thrive Fantasy. How's that for a transition? Our new sponsor, Thrive Fantasy. Go help us out. It's NFL Daily Fantasy. Go to thrivefantasy.com. Use the promotion code REACT, R-E-A-C-T. What you'll get there is you'll get 100% instant first deposit match up to $100. And they also have $50,000 NFL competitions for a $20 entry fee every week. Um, so go ahead and do that. Nick and I are going to do – we're signing up as well. We're going to do some – hopefully some competitions throughout the year, uh, picking some NFL. Thrive Fantasy is – it's supposed to be for people who don't necessarily spend a ton of time thinking about the NFL – you're sort of looking at the elite of the elite and then picking against other people like that. So um, anyway, if you want to help us out, please help us out. Thrive Fantasy, it's for the NFL. So if, if you're bummed and don't want to spend any more time thinking about this, go to Thrive Fantasy, promo code REACT, and help us out there. Yeah, a little bit different from what we normally do, but definitely super excited to partner with Thrive Fantasy here. And uh, yeah, we'll come up with some sort of interesting competition to, to work on throughout the year here. Well, we got to figure out some sort of prize, I think. Yeah, well, we got a bunch of stuff coming up. I mean, we, we're going to have to have like season ending Kirby Award, uh, you know, <laughs> Kirby Award celebrations and tuxedos, yeah. maybe <laughs> something like that. So we'll, we'll see. I, I, I honestly, I want to make an actual statue and, and send it to somebody. So, um, you know, we're, 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 we're going to troll some people out there. If, if even if Florida is not, not, not all that great, we're still going to have a good time. So make sure you keep tuning in, help us out. If you like what you're, what you listen to here, we appreciate all the support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for subscribing and following. Please share the link with, with friends. Uh, we like, we're trying to still grow the channel and everything. Will, Tough loss to Kentucky, but the season goes on. The March goes on. Gators playing Vanderbilt next week. Good talking to you, man. Yeah, man. To hell with Georgia. (laughs) Thank you for watching this episode of Stand Up and Holler. Be sure to subscribe to the Read and Reaction YouTube channel. Join our Patreon community at Read and Reaction for bonus content each week. 
and check out our website at readandreaction.com. I'm Nick Newton, joined by Will Miles, and as always, go Gators.